G'day guys, welcome to the Noob Spiro Podcast. I'm your host, Shrek, aka Isaac. Today we are going deep down the equipment, the spearfishing equipment rabbit hole with Jerry Guerra, a uh, one of the madmen behind Neptonics. Now, if you've been around spearing for a while, you've probably heard of Neptonics. If you are after like components for DIY spearfishing equipment and really good quality stuff, then you've definitely heard of Neptonics. So Jerry was kind enough to join me today. Really interesting guy. We geek out hard on equipment, so it's really cool. Hey, uh, before we get there, a couple of quick shout outs. Um, the 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing audiobook available on Audible. Uh, if you want it for free, go to noobspero.com forward slash audible. But uh, one of the customers in Amazon UK, it says... Uh, actionable, a fantastic book packed full of useful and actionable information, a must for Spiros. Never heard that word actionable, it's fantastic. Uh, what a great adjective. Hey, JH from the UK also says five stars. Love listening to these tips, really helpful. Thanks, guys. Uh, so, a couple of cool reviews there. If you want that book, again, go to newspiro.com forward slash audible. You can get it for free with a 30 day trial of Audible. Um, Byron says um, he bought the ebook version on Amazon. He says, I love the variety of information provided, a must for anyone looking to improve their time under the water. Then he goes on to ask where you can find access to the illustrated PDF, the dive day checklist and Facebook group mentioned uh, in the description. I I believe the hyperlinks are in the book and they should be. However, um, if you can't find them, Byron, email me shrick at noobspirit.com and I will sort you out. So I'm glad you enjoyed the book. Um, Also, review for the podcast, this one from Cham Beck in the US says, I really enjoyed this podcast, learned a lot. I started spearfishing in my early teens and got back into it when I moved back to Maui in my early 30s, though I wasn't really committed to technique. With the help of my mentor in this podcast, I've started to sharpen my spearfishing skills and have been able to catch some pretty good fish. So, hey, thanks for that review, Cham Beck. Um, today... We're in, you're in for a treat as well. We're, we're doing Jerry Guerra from Neptonics. This guy's a deep diver. He loves his Amero spear, spear guns, hunting Cubera snapper and diving off the deep wrecks of the Gulf Coast. Um, the biggest fish he's ever taken is, uh, is a measly 282-pound yellowfin tuna. Uh, and this guy loves his equipment. Let's get into it. This special episode of the Noob Sparrow Podcast is brought to you by spearfishing.com.au. Long-time partners of the Noob Sparrow Podcast, spearfishing.com.au, have a listener deal. Use the code Noob Sparrow to save $20 on every purchase over $200. Thanks for supporting the Noob Sparrow Podcast and shopping with spearfishing.com.au. Hey, g'day Noob Sparrow community. Today I've got on the line Jerry Guerra from Neptonics in America. Uh, huge brand in spearfishing. It's awesome to have you with you, Jerry Guerra. Uh, Ed Martin from Killshot Spear Guns kindly reached out and uh, connected the two of us. So it's awesome to have you with us, man. Thanks a lot, man. I've heard a lot about Neptonics over the years. I've had uh, Travis was a good uh, buddy here who sort of ran Neptonics Australia for a little while. But tell us a little bit about the Neptonics journey and how you sort of got involved with it all. Sure, man. So I started uh, my dive shop, which was Blue Water Sensations, um, in 2004. And um, that was in a laundry room of an apartment. And um, at that time, I was buying parts from Neptonics, and he was buying stuff from me as a distributor and did a lot of business back and forth. And then um, companies grew and left there in uh, 2014. Myself um, and Josh Gregory from Neptonics at that time merged our stuff together and um, never looked back. Yeah, sick. Okay, so it's a, it's it's sort of run of like 50-50 kind of thing now, you, the two of you guys? That is correct. All right, cool. So I did a little bit of stalking. As usual, the uh, the Noob Spiro research team was very um, thorough. <coughs> uh, I'm near. I'm, <laughs> that's my hint that it's not normally very thorough, Jerry. Um, but I, I was I was intrigued. I was intrigued about some of these sort of odd little facts about you. Um, the old man in the sea uh, is a is a famous book written by Ernest Hemingway. Um, that's listed as your favourite. What what? What do you love about that book? Oh man, just how they—it's just the classic um, man versus beast in the sea, versus uh, you know all the elements against him, from everything from sharks to uh, weather to to dehydration, the whole thing, man. It's just a uh, classic, just American literature of uh, at its finest of how um, man can prevail to outcome a super good obstacle in the ocean. Yeah, yeah, and that that sort of that respect as well, I think, is there as well. You know, not only for the the fish in the battle, but 
you know, what we have to put ourselves through to, to do it. And, um, and it's a bit of an honor involved with the whole, with the whole hunting theme as well, isn't there? Uh, absolutely. I've never read the book. I read a quick summary of it this morning, but uh, it's something that uh, you, you've inspired me to read it. I'm going to add that to my reading list for later on this year. Another thing I wanted to ask you about, and um, phallic cataclysm on Reddit sort of suggested as well that I ask you about, um, how you feel about the Boy Scouts in America going bankrupt and um, what effect that you think that that'll have on young people's engagement with the nature? You know, man, um, you know, I think they're going bankrupt, and that's a, a terrible thing, I, I believe, for that organization just because um, how instrumental it is to the children and the kids in America. However, I understand why they're doing it. They're doing it to fix a problem that they never had under wraps to begin with, but that's um, – I, I don't think that's either here nor there, but um, that, that's um, at the end of the day, it's, it's one of those, that example of uh, one bad apple ruins the group, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a phenomenal organization, and I feel like, I'm not sure how it is in Australia, but I feel like in America, like, um, you know, there's so many um, single family homes now where boys just simply don't learn what a screwdriver is, and that's just, uh, it's kind of sad. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a big theme for today's, um, section is going to be veterans fault and i really want to dig into equipment with you and i think like one of the things i've noticed about myself is um the some of the stuff i did a lot of when i was young i got a lot of confidence doing and mucking around and nutting out gear was not something i did a lot of and i think sometimes uh, you know like none of us really look like looking like idiots and if you didn't get exposed to some stuff early on then sometimes you feel like you know you're missing something and I think you know young people just need exposure to a lot of different stuff and then you know confidence comes through doing that not only that but role models and stuff like that and um, Boy Scouts is not a huge thing here anymore and I think you know there's several sort of versions of it around New Zealand and Australia but um, it's definitely something missing in our culture and I think it's yeah so I found it really intriguing that you've had so much to do with it um how did all that start when i was um i want to say i was maybe 10 years old i was on a swim team um a local swim team at a ymca and one of the one of the kids that was there with me his uh his dad was a scout leader and him and i uh, he invited me to go there one day and i, I went to a couple meetings and liked it and you know when um kind of grew up diving and spearfishing and camping with my dad and didn't really know anything about the whole scouting thing and um my dad took me to a scout meeting and that was uh that was the first one of uh like six or seven years in the scouts. Yeah, right. Eh? Cool. And and as an adult, did you did you get get back into it? Um, I have not um got back into it. I have been wanting to volunteer for some local scout groups, but um, for uh, nothing more than uh, I have not made time for that, and I need to. Mm-hmm. That's tough. It's a tough one to do, man. But yeah, no, nah, it's a really interesting point. And um, so is that sort of your, your your thoughts along the way as well? Is like you know it imbues young people with confidence and exposure to stuff as well? Yeah, absolutely, it is. And I mean, um, scouts is way more than just like camping and wilderness survival. It's everything from public speaking and learning how to present yourself and carry yourself. And as silly as what their uniforms look, it's you know it, it gives children kind of a sense of purpose. Like, hey, your 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 uniform's got to be ironed and cleaned and pressed, or you know, it's it's basically like a a light version of what the military would be for uh for boys. When I was young, I did an air training call, which is kind of like um you know like a cadets kind of thing, and um it was a similar idea. You got to iron your uniform and a lot of marching and stuff. I think it actually put me off joining the military because both my parents had that background. But uh, but it did imbue me with some sense of uh, some skills and stuff. The other, the other thing I think maybe it's it, it does for people is it teaches them about knots as well. Is that where you sort of started getting geeky on equipment? It absolutely is. Okay, cool. Yeah, knots is um, – knots, if you learn them, it's, it's very similar to a language. Like you learn basically what a half hitch would be or what a bite is and – it's like the simple parts of the alphabet, right? A, B, and C. And if you learn those simple parts of a knot, like you can tie any of them. Yeah, cool. It's not something I um, have ever developed a lot of ex- expertise in. My, my good mate, Matt, he had, comes from a climbing background. So, like, he's taken to tying knots and spearfishing like like you wouldn't believe. And he's really good to watch. But um, developing that sense of competence yourself is, seems to be a little bit of a journey. So um, I'm going to dig into that a little bit more in Veterans Vault. Now... Another interesting point was um, you're a really deep diver. Did that happen instantaneously? What, what's the? 
like you've been spearfishing a long time. How, how did your process go to work up to that? Man, it's um, you're gonna laugh at this one, man. Um, when I first got into free dive spearfishing was around 2004. I got into free diving, snorkeling, and lobstering and scuba diving when I was about five years old with my dad. And um, I got out of the Marine Corps and I signed up with the Omir Rife at the time, the Hatteras Blue Water Open tournament they had, and um, signed up over there. And um, I got paired up with um, Scott Campbell from the U.S. free diving team and um, went diving in the pool. Um, no, sorry, not the pool, went diving in the ocean. And um, at that time, this was my first free diving spearfishing trip I'd ever done. And I'd done a few on my boat that was exclusively free diving. So fitness wasn't the problem, but technique was absolutely a problem. So um, at that time in 2003, it was extremely challenging for me to dive and shoot fish in 30 feet of water, which would be approximately 10 meters. And uh, I got paired up with Scott, and he's like, hey, man, can I show you a few things in the, the pool and go over some breathing techniques? And he basically gave me a freediver level one course, um, <laughs> a very short version of it. And um, the next day I was at 88 feet, and by day three the, or by day four of the tournament, I was hitting 110 with it and um i just um at that point i just stayed in contact with scott campbell quite a bit and my friend gr and a bunch of us were just new into diving and free diving and spearfishing at the time um exclusively like um the free dive spearfishing side and i started training in a pool and um did um an fii class with uh martin stepanik yeah i sure did uh-huh and um over the course of about five years, I was um, passing 130 with no problem. And then um, in the last course I did, I did 202. Wow. That's epic, man. Yeah, but um, deep diving, um, it, it, and honestly, it came very, um, it, was, it was definitely worked for and earned. Um, but I didn't have any physical or physiology problems. Like equalizing was very easy for me. Frenzel technique was very easy for me. I didn't have some of those obstacles that other guys had and still do. Awesome. So very much uh, an incremental journey that was helped along the way by some expert tuition and actually doing the formal training. Is, uh, do you think the pool is, is sort of like a critical part of developing some of the, the, the smaller skills for, for effective freediving? Absolutely. Um, so is that something you still do? You still do a bit of pool training? Not really. No. Long past that, man. Um, I, the, only, the only training I do is spearfishing and diving and just keep cardio and fitness alive in the gym. Yeah, cool, cool. I, I got a little bit of a cheeky question here that I don't even know the background to. So Simon Tripp asks, um, what is your favorite land-based spearfishing advice? That would be fun to hear. My favorite land-based mm. spearfishing advice. So I'm going to take it that he means by uh, how do you get better, or I personally think, and this is coming from a Marine Corps background in me, is to maintain and take care of your gear properly like um. You know, if, if the gear is messed up, if your bands are messed up, if the rigging's messed up, um, there's nothing like your gear working and functioning properly to make you land that big fish. Like, that doesn't happen in the water. That is all the diligence that you do the weeks and the nights before you're diving, not on the trip. And if, you're, if your gear's not ready, it doesn't matter how good of a diver you are, you just don't get your fish. Okay, so, I mean, let's do a little bit of a practical scenario with that. So, you know, maybe in two days' time you're heading out uh, for a two-day overnight trip out spearfishing, what would be your process for preparing for that trip? Um, I would look at the bands on my gun would be my first step that I do. Um, I would make sure that the bands are in good condition. There's no dry rot. There's no nicks or nothing like that on them. Um, I would consider the last time I changed them. If it's been longer than six months, I'd put new bands on my gun. I'd look at the rigging. Um, specifically, if I have not shot a lot of big fish with that rigging, I would look at the crimps to make sure there's no corrosion. When you put copper crimps onto the stainless steel cable, that tends to form some electrolysis. And if you're seeing that, just cut the cable off and redo the rigging. Big fish on a two-day trip will cause big problems. And um, the biggest thing I feel like that has caused the most headache for all divers is they're not paying attention to the detail and having the rigging done properly. So um, myself, personally, when I come back from a trip, I, I strip all that rigging off um, of the guns and the shafts that's been used on a multi-day trip. And... I take it to the shop and I re-rig everything or the garage and I re-rig everything and my gear constantly sits on go, that whole be prepared thing. You never know when your buddy's going to call you and say bluefins are running or wahoos are running and the last thing you want to do is be leaving on a be leaving on a Thursday or Friday and you're, you have four hours worth of gear rigging to deal with. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, so you start with your spear gun, you're sort of going from power bands and your, your chicken shaft, uh, you're shooting line, and then... Slip tips uh, important too, if you're using that, if you're not using a slip tip to check your floppers, make sure they're, uh, they're tuned properly on untuned floppers, uh, you might as well just shoot a fish with a needle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so awful losing um, a fish because you haven't tuned your flopper properly. And there's some great some great videos online that can teach you how to do that as well. So, um, is that something you've spent some time doing as well? Have you got? Has Neptonics got a, a lot of DIY sort of um, video guides up? We we have a few D, D, um, DIYs, but not a lot. And we are in the process of making a uh, Neptonics Spearfishing Academy that will be pretty much everything from spearfishing from top to bottom, and it will be on the Neptonics uh, Spearfishing Journal and on individual pages where that gear is um, where that gear is available. Ah, cool, cool. One thing I really liked when I went over to the Neptonics site was the spear gun builder. Like, so you, you go in and it's literally got every single component. There's three or four different options for everything, um, whether it's anchor points, whether it's a mix or what, whatever it is. There's, and it, it seems like you guys have deliberately chosen people you want to work with. Uh, I didn't notice a lot of, um, you know, maybe, I don't, and I'm not picking on brands here, but there was, there was some... There, uh, Missing from the the page was some of the less reputable sort of suppliers and stuff and and brands. Have you guys deliberately sort of built relationships with vendors over the years? Um, we've we've built several relationships with several different gun builders, and um, there could just be someone in there that's um overlooked or never re necessarily responded to our um responded to our list of what we need for them to put it on the website as well. So it, it very well could be something that we've overlooked or something that they never replied to with um pictures or elements of that of what we need to make that happen as well. But most of the gun builders that we've, um, we have on the website, they've, um, they've done a really good job with a really good quality product. And, um, it's always amazing to see what, a what a craftsman and an artist can do with a, a piece of wood. Mm -mm -mm. So you, uh, okay, cool. So I'm really looking forward to sort of geeking out a lot on gear. I've got a ton of questions when we get there, but I want to dig into a little bit of your sort of spearfishing journey. So we've talked a bit about, you know, your, your journey to depth and sort of how you progress with the, with the freediving side of things. What about the hunting side of things? Um, did, did you struggle um, learning hu hunting techniques, figuring species out? What were some of the struggles you had in particular with hunting? Man, I, I really did, and I, I still sometimes do. I'm a much better diver than I am a hunter, to be honest with you. Um, sometimes um, a lot of people think that you just get lucky with fish, and if, if your diving ability becomes good enough, you'll start to get fish just when you have a long enough breath hold. But um, spearfishing for me has always been the harder part of developing that hunting skill, and a lot of it's just patience and not being aggressive. You know, a friend actually in Australia told me this when I was on a liveaboard trip with him. And um, this was like relatively recent in my spearfishing career. This is in the last three years. And he's like, you know, if you swim like a turtle and not like a shark, fish aren't scared of you. And your body language is probably the best the best thing you can do to close gaps on fish and not not act like a, that big predator. Do you, do you approach species strategically do you do you vary and change your approach based on sort of what you're hunting and things like that i do try to vary my my approach depending on what i'm hunting okay cool so give me a couple of go-to's in your area that you've um you feel like you've 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 developed sort of some some good approaches for sure so like if you're um whenever i'm diving on the reef it doesn't matter um if it's a deeper reef in 115 to 120 feet or say 30, 35 meters, or if it's something in five meters of water or 10 meters of water, the biggest thing I try to do is reduce my profile as best I can. Um, humans are, uh, we're even a smaller, even a smaller male or a smaller female is still creating a very big illusion when you have a five foot six plus person, three foot long fins and a five foot long gun, like it creates a 15 foot object in the water. Mm. Bigger. Um, so to answer that, I um, I always try to tuck my gun as close as I can, like the the muzzle under my shoulder, and bring that in. I also, when I do dive down, I try to dive in a very um, a very straight line and not in a, a very long arc. So when you're straight down, it creates more of a um, of a cylinder look versus what it would have like a um, say more of like a cone look the way it's coming in. So your profile is not projected as big, and then as soon as you do hit the floor or the ocean bottom. I try to lay as flat as I can to the bottom. Yeah, okay. And keep that profile extremely low. So mm. think of um, like sniper crawling in the woods versus a guy walking on the street. I've had several new guys that I've taken taken diving on my boat, and um, 
the one thing that's in common with them all is they, they get about four or five feet off the bottom or say a meter or maybe a meter and a half off the bottom and they won't, they don't close the gap on the fish, but what they're doing is they've created something that's very, very not natural on the bottom and, um, fish really sense that I believe. Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge one. I think particularly when people are out of their comfort zone in terms of maybe they're, they're actually trying to dive possibly deeper than they, they're they actually able to at that sort of point in time. And so they they hover off the bottom even though they're only maybe one or two metres off because they're kind of paranoid about actually being on the bottom. But like fish are much less intimidated if you're right there and you're, and you're buried amongst some structure or something like that. It really cuts your profile down. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a little bit like skylining too, uh, like with hunting, I guess. Like you, you don't want to give you you want to give them as little to look at from your sort of silhouette as possible, I guess. And uh, I like your analogy of the sniper in the woods. That's that's a it's a good way to think about it, I think. So um, so what like you you get to the bottom. Um, obviously, do you free fall a lot? I, I'm, I'm guessing you do when you're down deeper a lot. I I do um. From the free diving, the free diving world and the spearfishing world are they're, they're very, there's a lot of comparisons, but they're two different things. But I definitely glide. But I am I'm a very visual hunter. So when I what I mean by that is is I won't I won't just dive to the bottom and hope something's there. Like I try to put everything. And this is just like a, a rough average. Like if I know my gun's got an effective range of of 15 feet, like effective kill range, I try to put everything in with a 30 foot radius of where i'm at and i i call it the cone of death is what i'm diving in so as you dive down is if if i see a really nice fish or a a good trophy fish or anything that i'm like very very targeted and it's out it's say it's 35 or 45 feet outside of that cone i'll completely abort the dive go back up Mm. to the surface and breathe and i'll try to position myself so i can land on top of that fish on the way down but um that's something that's been really helpful for me um just while we're talking about streamlining and minimizing your profile on the way down, um, another problem I think a lot of us maybe have is um, equalizing. Like as soon as we go to equalize, we're kind of sticking our arm right out. And uh, not only is it inefficient in terms of streamlining and stuff, but I guess that's adding to our profile as well, like in terms of the way the fish perceive us as, as we're heading down towards them. Is that how, Have you worked on that? Um, and what's your advice for that? I have. So um, on, what a good rule of thumb for myself is, is I try to keep my elbow touching my loading pad on my chest. So when you walk down and dive and equalize, and if your elbow is on your loading pad, it keeps that profile very streamlined. It keeps your hydrodynamics correctly too. So it doesn't start acting like a rudder and changing your trajectory on that free fall. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Um I dive with another couple of uh, with a couple of guys who are starting to get pretty handy with the free diving. They're um, hunting, you know, sixty to seventy feet, uh, sort of that twenty twenty five meters, and um, and they're getting there no problem. They're getting time on the bottom, and that that they, they look starting to look really comfortable, and, and I'm really enjoying hunting with them. But one thing both of them do, and I haven't been able to help them solve this problem is they both one of them sort of winds on the way down like he's going around in a huge circular motion so he doesn't go down in a straight line and then quite often the other guy he'll head off on like a you know like a 25 30 degree angle so he's making his you know his 60 70 foot dive actually probably more like 80 or 90 feet because he's just heading on an angle every time have you got any advice for guys about how to do that i mean because sometimes you've got bad vis and you you can't even see what you're aiming at on the bottom yeah absolutely so there's a couple things and this will kind of go against what i just told you about trying to keep your gun tucked up to you and profiled so when you're on the surface and you're doing your breathe up, if you're right-handed or left-handed, keep the, your arm down at 90 degrees with your gun down straight below you. And you'll be able to see your gun at 90 degrees. So when you dive at that moment, when you're diving, the first, like, let's say let's say it is a 70-foot dive. If you'll dive and you're weighted properly, your sink phase should be at about 30 feet. So that first 30 feet that you're diving that you kick down to, keep that gun 100% down straight ahead of you and kind of use that thing as a guide that'll let you it'll it'll help you to visualize to be straight because you can't see up your body correctly because of the water distortion in the mask right but you can mm. see down the line of your gun so if you're letting your gun just kind of sink slowly in front of you and I'm not letting go of it holding that but that gun will help you get that trajectory right 
And then once yeah, you do that sink phase, then you can pull that gun in close to you. And at that point, okay. you're going to be sinking at that 90 degrees that you're looking for. Yeah, it's sick. All right, cool. I like that. Another good one, too, and this is, um, it can be a little challenging for divers, but um, I used to have that same problem where um, I would probably dive at like a six, uh, probably like a 75 degree angle versus that straight down 90 degrees that you're looking for. And a big yeah. portion of what's happening is, is it's very natural as spear fishermen that you want to look up and see what's happening. So if you tuck your chin down to your chest and then you'll position yourself 180 degrees the other direction, when you go to make that dive, you'll see everything that you want to see on that reef. You're just going to see it backwards or upside down. So it's it's basically like looking in the rear of your mirror. And at that point, you still get that, that 90 degree angle that you're looking for. And those two techniques will really help out a lot with that, um, that spiraling and that, uh, kind of thing. But the spiraling yeah. I reckon is from the, the head movement. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. And guys that have that temptation to look up all the time, so they, they don't have that sort of that upside down view, what's your advice to them? Like if they're going to do it, do you recommend like maybe just doing it every 10 fin strokes or something like that or, or how do they cut that down man I, I, honestly that's one of those um that's one of those habits that you really just got to be diligent on and just work on your technique and want to be a better diver um it, it, there's probably it's going to take a little bit of time to override that but if you if you mentally practice that like um it's like anything else if you do it wrong a hundred times it's going to take a long time to break that muscle memory but if you practice that technique in the pool you practice that technique on your dives you know, a few trips later, you'll have that technique down. It's not that hard to overcome. You just got to be, you just got to be the athlete that wants to be better at it. All right. So you, um, a lot, a lot of the stuff we're talking about is more for reef hunting. And, um, I like this cone of death idea. <laughs> um, so, so you get down on the bottom, you're, uh, you've minimized your profile. You maybe you're hiding behind a bit of structure that's between you and the fish you want to approach. Um, what, what are you doing from there? So, um, when I when I get down there, if um if nothing is immediately visual, I'll um I'll look in at some basic close whatever's close to me as far as caves or potholes or something like that. Grouper, um, grouper, coral trouts, um, snappers, um, they tend to go in holes sometimes, and you'll scare them into holes where they're right there. You never know; you might get lucky and find a, a lobster or craze, or you know sometimes you'll find some slipper lobsters in there and stuff too. But um, you know, don't be afraid to dive with a flashlight and look in holes. But um. I, I'm not um I'm not a guy who swims the reef. I I literally go down and I'll find like a small little area to set up and I'll just wait for a fish to come to me. But um, if you think about it, the the best um the best way I can ever explain it, if you're like at a dock or like in a harbor and you see bait fish on the surface, if you throw a rock into that school of bait fish, you'll watch them all spread out and scatter and run. But when that rock hits the bottom, if you wait ten to twenty seconds, like you'll watch the bait fish flow right back together like they were right before that rock hit so if you imagine yourself as that rock that you just threw into that school of fish they're all going to scatter but as soon as you hit that floor and you keep that very low profile and not a lot of movement those fish come right back to where they were because they don't visualize nothing chasing them or as a threat mm -hmm. nice and do you use bait to to sort of um reduce anxiety or the flight response in other species so like, um, you know, here we have these grey sawtail surgeon fish and quite often you can sort of hide in a school. And um, because those fish are comfortable around you, other fish, like the, our target sort of species, will come in and check you out. Is that is that something that works in your part of the world as well? It does. Like, well, um, a lot of times that we'll have like um, smaller amberjacks or spade fish that will do the same kind of thing. And um, yeah, absolutely. So where, where are you doing most of your diving? Um, I live in Tampa, so I do most of my diving out of the St. Pete to Tarpon Springs area. Okay, cool. So, what what about benthos and stuff in your area? What what are you, what are we what are we talking here in terms of bottom structure and and um, sort of prevailing conditions? We have a, a pile of artificial ledges. Um, I'm sorry, not artificial ledges. Artificial uh, reefs in, um, from barges to shipwrecks and a lot of limestone ledges. There's um, literally thousands of spots um, over our over our coastline to dive on. Um, everything from uh, they've um, sinking sinking um, World War II tanks that are underwater that people can dive on and and swim underneath and see fish on to barges to coast guard cutters to uh, um, to drainage pipes and rubble and old bridges they've torn down and made artificial reefs for us. Florida's got a really um, amazing natural natural reef and artificial reef program. 
Yeah, cool, cool. So in this in this broader area you're diving in, um, a lot of it's reef. Um, how do you share the love around so you're not overfishing one area? Are you guys pretty intentional about moving? Um, like around, how, how, how do you sort of work out uh, where you're going to go and, and what you're going to hunt? Sure, man. So for the artificial reefs, um, w- like typically those things are going to get hit a lot and those are, there's a lot of fish that just move in and out of there. So those things, um, when I, and the artificial reef program here is big, there's, um, there's hundreds of those. So I usually will hit the one or two of those, um, on every other trip, but usually different ones. And I'm just usually rotating those out of what area I'm diving in. But if I go to a ledge of mine, I won't usually go back to it for at least one year's time. And I'm constantly searching for new spots on the, on the bottom recorder and looking for new spots to dive on. Um, it'll drive a lot of my friends nuts because we'll spend so much time scratching bottom, but no one, <laughs> no one complains at the end of the day when they have a uh, five or six nice fish. Yeah. How cool is it when you drop down in a new spot and it and it's working and there's you know there's fish there that haven't seen a diver for you know obviously quite a long time oh it's incredible yeah re- re- reconnaissance it's like an experience yeah yeah i've seen it with a few of my friends unfortunately a lot of the times we head out it's an hour by boat and um we haven't been out for a couple of weeks so quite often we go to the same old go-to's and it's a bad habit but um it's it's that's kind of understandable i mean if you're not getting out diving enough so it's it's really good to um to hear the way you you sort of structure it um how do you how do you do your re- reconnaissance uh, what sort of electronics have you got on board so i use a, a garmin um 76s uh, chart plotter for my uh, gps and mapping system i use a furuno um 76r for my bottom finder and then i have a simrad autopilot that is um on a nema port 2000 that connects them both together okay nice and what are some sort of skills that guys need to develop in order to um find a new ground what are some um some of your little tricks Man, um, the, one of the best tricks I've ever found is, um, when it's very, it can be very challenging to learn how to read a bottom finder, but, um, know the difference of hard bottom and soft bottom. And whenever there's hard bottom, um, when you're scanning for that, try to learn what bait looks like. So for an example, like one day you're on the way out and you see bait popping. So drive over that school of bait on purpose. And you're not looking for the bottom structure, but what you're learning to do is get a visual image of what your bottom finder shows you what a pot of bait looks like. And when okay. you can visually understand what that looks like, when you're scanning the bottom and you're on hard bottom and you do see a school of bait, chances are there's a pothole there or a small ledge that is not big enough for your recorder to see. But if you mark that spot and dive it, there's typically good fish hold up on that. That might only be like a maybe a, maybe a half a meter of release or maybe a foot relief. But the small spots tend to be the fishiest because no one can find them and they don't get any pressure. Ah, uh, okay, cool. But um, and, it's just like it's just like anything else with uh with fishing. If you find the bait, you find the fish, and that I feel like that rings true for blue water and for the reef. Mm, mm, mm. And what about how current interacts and um with with some of the like the ledges and structure you have? Do you guys have a lot of current? We do. We have a we have a we have some really hard current here. Okay, what's the prevailing sort of um oceanic? the broader currents and how do they interact with your coastline so on this um on the gulf side where i'm at there is no oceanic current the um the east coast of florida has the uh the gulf stream which is a really really big current but um we have a lot of tide movement we have a lot of um a lot of river outflow in florida so we have a lot of um we have a lot of that our water is really shallow here up in the um from where my boat's at in Hudson up to home Asasa, I can take people out 17 miles and only be in 22 to 25 feet of water. So oh, it's, wow. um, it's very shallow. And that being said, like the current just flows really hard through that. Mm. Um, it, when it's a slack tide, it's completely fine. No current at all, but it's not uncommon at all for us to have two and a half to three knot current. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and so um, are you guys getting, finding a lot of the bait and the, and the predating species, are you finding that over the fronts of reef? Um, how does how does uh, how does it affect how the marine life behave? They they typically do go to the front of that. They, um, whenever the current's moving really hard, I always try to work up current as far as I can up current ahead of the reef or the wreck. And um, the fish tend to love that. And um, diving in current can be very hard and challenging to do. But once you learn how to do that, and the fish and quality of the fish you'll get are amazing in it. Awesome. So, I mean, what's a what's a fish or a you know something a fish maybe that you've taken or or maybe it was a near miss that you're 
your this stands out in your memory for you? I mean, I sh I shot a um a big black grouper probably about let's see probably about 10 12 years ago and i don't know what he weighed but i'm gonna i without exaggerating i feel like he was a very solid 100 pound black grouper wow. um without exaggerating and i wouldn't be surprised at all if he was 90 and i wouldn't be surprised at all if he was 110 because he was hands down the biggest black grouper i had ever seen still to this day i literally i went down and i was looking inside caves for a fish and i seen this thing and I was like, it, I was just completely just like blown away by it. At first, I thought it was one of our Goliath groupers. And I was like, kind of just did a double take on it. And then it swam out of the hole. And when it swam out of the hole, I realized it was a black grouper. And then it literally was like five feet off the end of my gun. It just stopped and looked at me. <laughs> and that's when I realized, I was like, oh, man, this is a big fish. And I, I literally, so I turned and I shot him. And I must have just barely missed the kill shot and put it right behind his head. I remember like he did like this weird arc that he like swam and he was trying to shake the shaft and I was trying to pull in my shooting line and collect it. So he wouldn't bury in the reef, the reef too deep. And he was heading at the reef and there was this hole that was probably maybe a third of what his size was. And I was kind of like laughing inside. I'm like, Oh man, this guy has got a spear straight through his head and he's going in a hole that there's no way he'll fit in. And I was, and I remember thinking, I'm like, oh, I got him. He's going to, it'll hit the shaft. The shaft will stop him from going in. And he hit that thing and that shaft bit a hundred degrees each way. And it literally folded with him. And he took that thing in the coral with him. <laughs> I could hear the spring seal shaft, like clicking on the coral, like opening, like, like literally it had formed a complete U and it literally, it kept swimming in there. And it was pulling me with it as it was swimming in there and bending the shaft. And, um, I wasn't, I was never able to find him or get him out, um, at all so it was a pretty terrible day like fish haunts me out I, I killed a big fish for no reason lost my gear the whole bit like i still remember it like it happened 10 minutes ago it's pretty terrible mm -hmm. any any takeaways from that situation would you have done anything different or was it just one of those things i would um looking at it i i feel like i did everything correctly i wish um i, I feel like when i first shot him i probably should have tried to react a little bit faster and collect that shooting line. So he couldn't have got into that coral. But, you know, at the end of the day, he was just a big enough fish that I really think if he was, I really think even if I'd have done that, he would have still got in there. He probably wouldn't have got in there as far, but I still wouldn't have been able to retrieve him. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the biggest problem that I found was, is the hole that he went into, there was no way for me to even go in there and look at that. You'd have need a, you would have needed two crowbars and a stick of dynamite to access it. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's, I've seen it happen myself. Uh, I've seen fish just disappear into what looks like nothing. And then you're trying to find another angle on a bit of reef or a hole. And, you know, like, it's funny how they, some of the, you know, the holes, they don't match up. And, you know, they just disappear into nothing. And, it, you know, like, you can hang, sometimes you, you know, you're that annoyed that you've had this battle with this fish, even if you haven't shot it, that you, you'll spend an hour just continuously bombing one bit of reef in the, in the, in the hopes of finding it again. But um, generally, they don't come back out again. No, it's, it's almost like a magic trick they pull at the, those little locations they get into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's tough, man. That that would be that'd stand out of my memory too. None of us like wounding or injuring fish and not putting them on the boat or or taking them back to the shore. Kill shot spear guns, timber guns made in the USA. Simple, effective, dependable. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin. These spear guns are an absolute work of art. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com. And, hey, I've got a special for you, 30 bucks off user code NOOB. That's just NOOB, N-O-O-B. For a limited time only, save $30 on any spear gun. At Killshot Spear Guns, save 30 bucks on any spear gun. Check it out. Is that more spear fishing shit? Yeah, it is, honey, but it's my favourite podcast. You just kind of stop yourself. You're obsessed. Well, that's true, but Shrek told me I'd, I'd lose my 90s dad look. Baby, it's all for you. For those that are a little obsessed, head over to noobspirit.com forward slash madgear. We've got hats, beanies, tank tops, t-shirts and hoodies for noobers who are mad about spearing. Noobspirit.com forward slash madgear. All right, man. Hey, um, you've spent a lot of time out spearing. Um, 32 years between sort of scuba and, and, and freediving. But um, 
what's one of the toughest situations you've you've had out and um and, and what and what sort of did you take away from it so before i was um a little bit more educated with it i was diving um i was diving on a deeper wreck in hatteras and um i had a shallow water blackout and um i was diving with a buddy and that worked out really well and um at this point in my diving career i, did, I had like some some like some training or informal training if you want to call it that but i didn't know a lot about like the physiology of what a shallow water blackout could be and i had a shallow water blackout um I was I was down extremely deep um, on a wreck. The wreck was about 300 feet of water. I was down about 115 feet. There was big yellowfin tunas down at that depth, and I was trying to close the distance on one at 110 feet. And I shot. I pulled the trigger. I completely missed it. Should not have pulled the trigger. Completely rushed it. Started swimming up, and I got to about 30 feet and thought, "Oh man, I'm not going to make it." And I took my weight belt off and I held it in my hand. My dive buddy came and met me. And I think I made it to about 10 feet or so, and, and I blacked out. He took my weight belt. I woke up completely um, completely quick, came to on the surface within about 15, 20 seconds. And um, just from not the knowledge of what, what to do after that, I got in the boat and felt a little loopy and tired and um, kind of shook it off, like um, got a Gatorade out and drank a bottle of water. And they did two more drifts on the wreck, and I got back in the water. <laughs> dive on this thing i like i regained myself pretty quickly i was like pretty happy about it felt good again and i went down and my next dive was to like 18 19 feet and blacked out the second time in the oh, same wow. day and i was like all right this is a this is a little problematic so um this was all before i had done any kind of uh any kind of free diving courses whatsoever so um yeah that was uh the takeaway on that is um man don't be afraid to learn hmm. it's a it's a tough one isn't it like um we're blokes and sometimes we don't like looking like we're learning and particularly as we get older i think it's a trap as well um i mean but we're always learning we're always we should always be upgrading our ideas and our processes and our thinking i mean is that is that kind of your take on it absolutely mm. I, I could not agree more um i, I don't know I, I learn constantly and um I, I that's part of why i like to dive with uh with new guys so i always keep the one or two guys that are like the quote unquote, the veterans with you that's been your long-term dive buddy. And then I always try to bring the new guy or the guys that I haven't dove with because you can always learn from them and they can always learn from you. And it just kind of, uh, it's kind of part of the the culture that we, you know, just pass down the knowledge to the next generations and keep the sport alive. Mm -hmm. It's, it's bloody awesome sometimes when you, when you head out and you've got a crew uh, that you can rely on, you, you know, like everyone knows their, their part, They're, they've got your back and, and you, you just have a really relaxing, good dive day. But, um, but there's also a lot to be said for giving into that next generation as well. That can be incredibly rewarding as well. Um, who are you? Who are your regular dive buddies? Um, my regular dive buddies would be, uh, James Ware, Lee Hoagland, um, and my dad. Yeah. Wicked. Wicked. And, um, how do you guys work? Bodhi duties and buddy pairs and stuff. What's so, some of your sort of your go-to systems? So um, I like to dive in um, in teams of three, not one up, one down, but um, one down, two up, and then safety safety dive that if you need to. It, it does tend to get spread out a bit um, time to time, and that's why I think it always kind of works well with groups of three because if someone does get a little bit distracted with a the fish, there's still two guys watching and keeping an eye on it. But um, but um, yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of the duties that we follow and try to stay on board with it it's it's quite effective it works really well yeah cool and um i mean you guys all probably know who's the better divers and hunters in your, in your crew what do you do when like say you're diving with a couple of people and uh, well let's do both scenarios scenario one they're both diving you know half the depth of what you're used to sort of hunting in and then the other scenario is you go out with a bunch of freaks of nature and that they they want to dive much deeper than you're really comfortable with what, what what do you do in both of those situations so um whenever whenever i'm taking newer guys out i try not to take them out to waters they can't comfortably dive and hunt so um i try to eliminate that that threshold and just eliminate that that competitive streak because um as as males, we're all like super competitive to wanting to keep up and outdo each other. But that, at the end of the day, that's what gets you hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, free diving is a very, it wouldn't necessarily say slow is the right word, but it's definitely a progression sport. It's not something that you, it takes years and years to master it, if there even is a way to master it, to be honest with you. What about the opposite scenario? I mean, maybe it's been a few years since you've been put in this position, but what, do you, what did you do when, um, you know, you were going out with a bunch of guys and they were, you know, 
far, far, far better, far deeper divers than you were. Oh, I did everything wrong from overweighting myself and trying to dive as deep as they could and pushing it and um, trying to like set up some kind of pendulum dive to packing my lungs tighter than I probably should have. But um, looking back at it, hindsight 2020 is I'd have never pushed myself to do that. Mm -mm, mm. The nature of us is boys and girls, eh? Like it's, it's, it's constant improvement. I mean, some days you, you do have a bit of a push. You might be diving a little bit deeper than you, you're comfortable. Um, ha, is there any, anything you'd advise people to do to manage that risk better? Um, you know, like I, I feel like to kind of elaborate on that a little bit, I feel like every diver has a good day and a bad day. Like there's some nights where like maybe you didn't sleep well or you're a little dehydrated and your, your diving ability is off, but um, – you know, just kind of listen to your body on that. If you, if you're feeling good and you want to push it, just, it's kind of like, um, you know, just make sure your dive buddies are watching you like, Hey, I'm going to try to go a little bit deeper on this one. Um, I'm going to try to push it a little bit longer. Just, you know, spot me, just kind of just communicate with your partner. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? How our body changes. Like sometimes you have a perfectly good night's sleep, hydration's good and you still, you, you know, your body's just not playing the game. And for, for whatever reason, you're not relaxed and your body's just doesn't want doesn't want to um, perform as well as it normally does, and uh, it can be it can be quite annoying. And and there is a temptation there to just dive like you normally do anyway. So it's a hard one. It is. It's a very it's a very challenging one to overcome. And it's um, but you know at the end of the day, smart divers are still alive. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, good. Hey, let's move into Veterans Vault. So this is the part of the show where we sort of take our special guests sort of deep into an area of their expertise. And obviously, you've been geeking out on equipment for a number of years. So um, I'm looking forward to getting schooled. I provided you with a little bit of background before the show. Um, basically, I think sometimes I'm a bit lazy. And I say things like, I'm not a gear guy and things like that. Um, and I perhaps offload some of my responsibilities about maintaining my equipment to others uh, how do you sort of advise people like me man the best advice i could give you on that is no one's going to take care of your gear like you would so you know it's a, it's a really good thing that every spear fisherman spear fisher woman should know is how to tie their own bands how to rig their own stuff and even if you do rely on your buddy to do that for you it doesn't mean you shouldn't know how to do it but um that the, the best advice i could give you on that is if you are going to go down that route where you want your friend to rig that from him, don't ever yell at him when your shit breaks. <laughs> yeah, that's a good call. You can't blame anyone, can you? No, it's no one's fault but your own, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I've wrote down a ton of questions here. So um, let's get into Mex. Um, you've got a number of different styles on your website. Uh, what what are sort of the pros and cons and applications for some of these mechs? The, um, so sure. So the tuna mech is a precision mech. It's um, rounded, so it's very easy to install. It does take a little bit of lined up on it. It is uh, it's designed for four bands and more. The the trigger mech um, is it's built like a tank. It's it's designed to have a very smooth release with four plus bands on it. Um, the reef mech is a very simple install. It needs to be mortised in. It has a um, line release on the side. Um, same thing, this, this tension on it is designed to be three bands or less on that. Um, and then the reverse mechanism has um, the line release built into it on the side, and it also is flipped backwards, so it gives you about two inches more band pull, which doesn't sound like a lot, but on three bands, it's six more inches of band pull. Um, that's also a very easy install for a gun builder. Um, very strong mech. All of the sears of... Um, had none of those have ever failed. We've loaded those up to plus 1,000 pounds, which would be equivalent to about nine to 10 bands, depending on what end you're using. And the back of the shaft always fails first. Okay. Yeah, right. Far out. Um, materials. I mean, a lot of your stuff's for um, wooden guns. Do you make stuff for pipe guns as well? Um, how do you feel about, so obviously a lot of it's stainless, but how do you feel about others using other stuff? Uh, man, there's... Um, you know, there's a handful of stuff that you could use for other components. Um, at the end of the day, salt water is a very, very, very harsh, abrasive environment, and it wants to destroy everything. And then the sun is the second biggest culprit next to that salt water, and your gear constantly sits in there. And at the end of the day, a mechanism is not something that you should take chances on, in my opinion. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Joe Pedro asks, what kind of spear tip is preferable for for each common spe species. So he's in particular, he's interested about learning about slip tips and some of the other uh, things like the Chimera side slip. Uh, Rob Allen have got 
uh, version out as well. How do you think about what setup to use when, when? Sure. I, I personally love um, I love a double flopper shaft, one on the top, one on the bottom. That's my personal favorite. So that way, if one does, um, one is untuned for some odd reason that, you know, you shoot a fish and it bends that, and then, you know, you, you're not going to retune that thing on the boat, but you're not really aware that it's untuned. You still have a pretty good capability of landing your fish. Um, I like a flopper shaft, a double flopper shaft for pretty much everything for the exception of targeting wahoo, bluefin tunas, and yellowfin tunas. Those are the three species that I, if I'm ever targeting those three species specifically, I'm, I'm going to be using a slip tip at that point. But um, I have, um, I've seen the Camara side slip and I've seen the Rob Allen drop tip, if I'm not mistaken. That's what we're talking about there. I do like the ingenuity of those. I do not trust that thing to work. When you pull the trigger of a spear gun, those um, those things are resting on the rivet of a flopper. Mm. And what I've seen happen is a lot of guns will have that little bit of um, half an inch muzzle flip, and that is just enough to knock that thing off and send it to the back of your uh, your shaft, and you basically shoot your fish with a needle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use the Cam- I use the Camara side slip for a day, and I went out and I shot five fish and i landed five fish um but uh, but i agree with you but the the problem i had was getting it to sit back on and having to like even when i'm resting up on the surface it would fall off and then i was having to continuously sort of you know pick it up and put it back on again and when i was swimming down through the water column sometimes i'd have to hold it on an angle so it didn't fall off i found when i actually shot it because all of the the acceleration was moving in one direction it, it held on quite well but it was just getting to the actual shot that was the problem i haven't used the raw balance so i've got no comparison there but i just found that the extra complication um was more than i sort of wanted uh, i'm i'm a real simple guy uh and i and I, I just found it more 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 trouble than than i than i like but i'm probably going to explore it again in the future it's just you know when you get when i get out spearing which is at the moment it's about once or twice a month, I really just want to go spearfishing and not have to worry about equipment. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that too. The one, the other thing I too, this I don't believe would cause you to lose a fish, but I definitely, um, I love the idea that you can take a flopper shaft and convert that into a, a very readily available, convert that into a slip tip. So I think I do love that part about it. Mm. I also, I also think of how many fish I've shot with flopper shafts, and sometimes you'll bend them right there at that little rivet hole in the flopper. Mm. So at that point, like with a slip tip like you just ruin the base and you can get a new base and that's the case like you just ruined your flopper shaft and your slip tip shaft for the day and now you're in the boat with another shaft yeah yeah okay okay cool i'm like you um, i'm a huge fan of simplicity and um coming from the marine corps that whole acronym of kiss is uh never, <laughs> never rings truer in this scenario which is uh keep it simple stupid yeah <laughs> for sure um Double floppers aren't aren't very popular in New Zealand and Australia. I don't think South Africa either. Um, so without having any exposure to using them, um, what are some of the – so you give me some of the pros. Obviously, not losing fish is fantastic because you've got, you know, two potential barriers there for, for the fish from coming off the front of your spear. And so if, if one's not tuned quite correctly or it fails to engage for whatever reason, the other one will hold your fish, which sounds fantastic to me. What are the cons of the system? So the cons are is there, there's now two weak spots in your shaft, so there's two possible spots for it to bend. So that's a pretty big, uh, a, a pretty good-sized con. I find if one's going to bend, the other one's going to bend no matter what. So you, you you do add in that extra layer of something to go wrong. However, it it's always the first one that tends to bend on the on the hard, heavy target because that's where it's taking the brunt of the impact at. The um the other con is is they're a little bit more expensive. And how does it affect the way they track through the water when you pull the trigger? I, I personally don't notice anything different. Um, a lot of guys will say that it creates more drag, but I mean at the end of the day, I think that's something that a machine could dictate, but never a human being. Yeah, okay, so you're not even going to notice it. Is that what, is what you're saying? Because, I mean, they are only traveling a relatively short distance. So That's correct. They're traveling a relatively short distance. And then the other side of it is, is you know, one's on top and one's on bottom. So sometimes a flopper can get tweaked a little bit and cause some inaccuracies just because, like, the you know, the, the back tail of it is kind of pried open so it'll hook on a fish. So that does kind of counter that out. And I do find the shot placements to be a little bit more accurate with them. Okay, cool. Um Shaft overhang, huge, huge point of debate. Um, what's your philosophy? I personally like 11 inches of overhang on all of my guns. And um, 
that I feel like is a very good ratio to the shaft weight to the band rate, the band stretch ratio on a gun. And why I like a, that's just my opinion of it. You could do 10 inches. You could do 12 inches. I think anything much past that and the line of sights get very challenging to line up. But the one thing that I can tell any diver and a lot of guys will probably argue this, but the one thing I find consistent is most spear fishers, have a multiple two to spear guns, somewhere between five or 10 spear guns. But if you keep that same consistency across all of your spear guns, whether it's slip tip or whether it's flopper shaft, um, you find your shafts being very, very, your, not your shafts, your, your shot placement being very accurate from one gun to the next because your line of sight never changed to when you line it to the target. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, that's, that's, that's one thing I've noticed too. It's like the guys that have got, particular opinions about overhang they just stick to the same formula and i think a lot of you know way back in the early days too one of the guys on the show made the point of sticking to the same handle as well um and there's a there's a host of issues with with that and i wanted to get into triggers triggers and handles actually trigger pressure is a very tricky thing with a spear gun it's not like a rifle because they're friction-based mechanisms and the way our handles uh, are shaped and made it or molded or not seems to affect where our finger sits on the trigger and um i know i'm i'm a bit of a guilty of it as well it's pulling shots and stuff when i'm like if i'm having to apply too much trigger pressure how do guys think about and organize this correctly so to answer that this is um this is coming from the marine corps uh rifle rifleman school and basic training so when you're lining up on your spear gun so even if your handles are different you basically want just the very tip of your finger touching that trigger not anything much past that and sometimes it can be a little tough to feel that with your glove especially if you're using a three millimeter glove but anyways the very tip of your finger onto that trigger and then when you line up on your target and you go to pull that trigger, the same way you shoot a rifle, it's a very slow, steady squeeze, slow, steady squeeze, and let the gun surprise you. And at that point, you never squeeze that gun too hard to change the inaccuracy of the gun shot with your own hand. Uh, okay. Okay, cool. So you, you kind of let it sneak up on you a little bit. You absolutely do. All right. And it's a smooth, It's a, by, like we're talking like fractions of a second here, so it's a smooth squeeze. Very, very slow and steady. So guys that, like a lot of us use hardware store gloves and things like that and i and i, I don't i'm not criticizing it at all because it's great to save some money on some kit somewhere and um but do you think that the inconsistency between thicknesses and gloves and the material that we have on gloves do you think that that is something that can potentially be a cause of inaccuracy it, it very well could be i think that it would be a very small one i do believe the way people react to stuff and get excited or they get that buck fever and they suddenly jerk that trigger and they normally don't like um the more you dive in the the more comfortable you get in the water the the more refined your skills get and then that's when that kind of goes away and it just becomes second nature you know quoting terry moss here if you uh, if you take your spear gun and you get in the pool with it and you or you get in a shallow end of a bay and you shoot that gun for two hours in there you'll learn more about that gun in an hour and a half or two hours than what you will in a season of diving and experiment with a gun, you know, take take your your cold water gloves and your Dyneema gloves or gloves and try them all side by side till you learn that gun right. But you never go on a big hunting trip and not sight in your rifle. It kind of doesn't make sense to not sight in your spear gun. Yeah, yeah, cool. It's, a, it's another um, lesson that's coming through loud and clear and it's not a habit that I've put in place yet. But um, point taken, sometimes it's inconvenient where the water's too far away or you haven't got a swimming pool to test it in. But I, I guess you have to come up with a way to do it. It's, it's extremely inconvenient, but um, most of the time that I did spend doing that is on a dive trip that you're going out and some kind of boat failure slash mechanical problem where the weather was supposed to be nice and it wasn't nice. And at that point, that's you got basically an hour a day at your disposal, so and you're already at the water, so just take advantage of it. It's a good place and a good time to drill some rescues with your mates too, particularly if they haven't done a, a, a formal course or something or, or not for a long time. Yeah, I mean, it's a real it's a real good way to, you know, to still hang out with your buddies and still accomplish something productive and, you know, refine your skills. Like I said, you've already allotted that, that day off to do it. Might as well, might as well utilize it for what you love. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, handles, to mold or not to mold? I, I'm a huge fan of the AR-15 home grips. That's just my personal opinion, and that's on every one of my spear guns. Okay, cool, nice. Okay, so that'd be no mold. So you go for consistency. I do. All right, cool. Safety, 
do or do not have in the words of Yoda? I do not. <laughs> never. You never have a safety. Never have a safety. I can never tell if a shotgun is loaded. I can never tell if a handgun is loaded. I can always tell if a spear gun's not loaded. Yeah. That it's I don't understand why we even have safeties on spear guns. They they that all they do is <laughs> ruin shot shot opportunities and they, they don't seem to add any safety because you still can't point a spear gun at someone. You still can't have your finger in uh, near the trigger. So I don't understand why we even have them. Well, the the wonderful uh Corporations of insurance said that the word gun is on that item and it has to have it. Ah, righto. Okay. Okay, <laughs> cool. I haven't really thought about that from a liability point of view, so that, that does make sense. Um, it, it would be nice though, if there was a way to disable it quite easy. I'm guessing I'm guessing there is with some, some mech setups, but yeah. So we talked a little bit about shafts. Tom asks, a question that I spend a lot of time researching was how to eliminate points of failure. What kind of knots, bungees connected to gun or float, what gauge shark clips, better options for shooting line bungee, basically how to make your connections as fail safe as possible. So, um, yeah, let's get into that. So from one end of the gun to the other, um, I mean, we can talk about Dyneema, Mono. Let's let, I mean, let's start from... Well, we've already talked about shafts and floppers and stuff. What about so shooting line from shaft to spear gun? What what? Are... I use Dyneema as all my shooting line. I like it just because um, if it does get a small nick or a tear in there, I can always cut it off very quickly on the boat. I'm not fiddling with my crimping tools. However, I do find that mono shoots a bit cleaner and more accurate. But um, oh. I do that out of efficiency. Simple point. I tie double figure eights on everything. Um, a figure eight on the a double figure eight on the bite on the shark fin to where it connects. And then just an overhand double figure eight to where it connects to the swivel coming off of a reel or a double figure eight to where it'll attach to the bungee for a breakaway adapter. But um, okay. double figure eight is the strongest knot on the planet, as your climbing friend knows. Um, a bullen is a very simple and effective knot as well. However, it reduces the strength of line by about 42%. Um, okay. A double figure eight only reduces the strength of line by about 18%. So that's a that's a huge difference and um dyneema is just extremely strong for its size the tensile strength on it's amazing most of the the stuff around 1.8 is over 660 pounds breaking strength mm -hmm. which is um just massive and how often are you replacing your dyneema shooting line if i'm if i'm on the reef and i'm typically targeting fish that are under 10 kilos um i just kind of visually inspect it and as needed and if um if it's been used um two or three trips and Stuff like that, I'll strip it off and put it on there. Um, if it's on a blue water gun and I've got one big tuna, it gets cut off at the end of that, that day and a new shaft goes in with new, new rigging. Oh, wow. Wow. That's a, that's a fair bit of cost. Um, it absolutely is. It is. Um, there's nothing uh, cheap about that, but the, the thing that's kind of foolish is to spend three or $4,000 of your hard-earned money on a liveaboard trip somewhere and to shoot a beautiful trophy fish at 200 plus pounds and then the next day you shoot another one and you don't get to land it because you didn't change your rigging mm, mm, mm. nice so you, you sound very disciplined with with your approach to to rigging um is that something you, you like to instill in the other people around you and uh do you have some standardized payouts for people that uh <laughs> that lose fish <laughs> um no, no, not really. Um, I haven't even thought about that part of it. I kind of, um, I just kind of break it down in the law of averages. You can pay now or pay later. Um, I would rather pay up front and keep my fish and have a little bit more Dyneema in there than not get my fish, not have my shaft, and then buy shaft and Dyneema. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. uh, it's a law of averages. At some point, it works against you. If you, you can be cheap, but it catches up to you. So, I mean, with the Dyneema mono shooting line argument, um, a lot of people talk about memory with uh, with mono, like it'll it'll hold its shape around around the gun, and then you can you you have to use a bungee really to make sure that that line's nice and tight. Um, I haven't used Dyneema. What's the learning adjustment curve like changing over, and what are some of the the cons? I mean, you you mentioned. Um, you you lose a little bit of accuracy, you believe? You I, I do think it um it, it is thinner, but I do feel like it travels a little bit slower in the water. And um, it's not a huge noticeable thing, but I can definitely I can personally notice the difference. And it might not be the actual dynamic; it could just be the bulky double figure eight knot that is tied on there too. A, a combination of that maybe. The 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 mono having the memory is a very true thing, but what you gotta also understand is mono is very very lightweight, and so is Dyneema, 
and there's only approximately 16 or 17 feet of that if you have your gun double looped and mm -hmm. you have a shaft that weighs over a pound and mm -hmm. you have that shaft traveling out with a velocity of about 240 pounds force so the argument where people are making or the what they're wrapping their head around is it's one of those things that I feel a machine can dictate and not a not a person you know, that's one of those things, too, that, like I said, if you shoot your gun a few times in a pool or in a shallow bay, that you can learn all that and then you can make your own decision and put that put that animal to bed. Mm. But it's very easy to to beat yourself up in the in the details that don't necessarily matter because you mm. heard it, you heard it through a grapevine or read it on the Internet somewhere. Yeah, yeah. That's why I try and get I always try and get both sides of the argument because generally Spiros have got very strong opinions about this stuff, but the ones that can articulate kind of both sides of the argument, I find them the more interesting ones to listen to because you can tell that they haven't just swallowed something hook, line and sinker and they're running with it. They've, they've thought about it and they, they've made a decision based on, you know, a, f a few different criteria. So it's um, always good to sort of hear it on the podcast, I think. Um, did you did you start off with mono mono and change to Dyneema? I did. What, was there any adjustment curve to that? Uh, there there was not too much of an adjustment curve. The one the one adjustment curve that I did have is uh, Dyneema. It it is um, mono is very easy to see like when it wants to twist and do like that weird like um, telephone cord shape if you want to call it that. And yep. Dyneema will tend to do that, and you don't see it because it's such a thin line, and the the fibers are so small inside the the jacket. Yeah. When you do put your shaft back in, it's extremely I wouldn't say extremely important, but it's important to pinch the line at the back of the shark fin when it's after it's set in its mechanism. And when you pull the line through, you want to pull it through two fingers like very tightly, so you're pulling out all the loops and stuff that are in that line, so it wraps and it lays on your your spear gun cleanly. Okay. Okay, interesting. And I mean, I think the other big intimidating point is um, if you're a mono dude, you know, everyone knows how to crimp, a, um, you know, use a crimping tool and, and put on a crimp, but a lot of people aren't as confident in their knots. So this, this figure eight seems to be critical to using Dyneema. Is that the other part of it? Um, it it's not, I wouldn't say it's critical, but um, I, I you could use a bowline or you could use a... Um... I guess you could use a, an overhand knot or something along those lines. I just personally like the double figure eight because it's the strongest knot. But that's just uh, that's just me probably overthinking something simple. No, no, I like it. I like it, and I like the rationale behind it. Okay, cool. Um, so that's kind of shooting line. Let's let's. The the other thing you mentioned was swivels. Where are you using swivels in your equipment? So um, if I'm shooting with a reel, I have. Um, the real line will go through the line anchor in the front, and then I'll use a. Uh, I personally like pigtail swivels over snap swivels, but that's just my opinion. Um, there's from the strength side, they're both uh, they're both extremely strong and effective. I just like the the pigtail swivel from a an effective standpoint. Um, I feel like there's a little bit less chance of it opening up if it gets side loaded on an initial run of a fish. Mm. But um, that's something that's probably one out of a, every three hundred. But that would typically happen on the of that 300th time when it does happen would be on the biggest fish that you've shot. So oddly, <laughs> odd how uh, Murphy's Law will get you there. <laughs> and um, I've been caught out not running Dyne Dyneema through anchor lines as well. Um, and then it, it, that seems to be when a lot of guys get, uh, you know, they get their reel gets locked up. Is that is that another sort of lesson learned? Um, so, yeah, so reels will tend to lock up, but that's another one of those things that where uh, – you know, screws tighten down to the right, and if you don't spool the line on the right direction, like when that fish starts running, um, it'll backload on there and start to tighten down on the drag itself and, and do that. But um, once again, if you maintain your gear properly and wash it and check that reel out every, every time before your trip, you'll not have that problem. Upgrading the composite or carbon fiber spearfishing fins is a huge step in your spearfishing journey and you want to make a smart investment so i'm going to suggest investing your moolah in penetrator fins these fins have got a long lasting performance they've got a warranty that outperforms anything else in the industry check them out at penetratorfins.com their before and after sale service is absolutely phenomenal these fins are being worn by champions all over the world check them out at penetratorfins.com for a limited time only use the code noobspero to save $25 on any purchase of composite or carbon fiber fins check them out penetratorfins.com 
Spearing Magazine, possibly the world's best spearfishing publication. It's a spearing mag for spearos by spearos. Part of the reason I like Spearing Magazine so much is because there's crazy stories from Spiros just like you from all around the world and it's what makes Spearing Magazine such a special publication. If you go to spearingmagazine.com, check out the article submissions page. There's a full guide to how to submit an article but I would encourage you to do so because I want to read about your adventures and inspire everyone else to take on their next spearfishing adventure. That's at spearingmagazine.com. Okay, so we've, we've, we'll move back. We've, we've done sort of shooting line in the front end of the spear gun. Uh, what about coming off the back end? What's your setup like? So sometimes you're using reels. Uh, when do you use? When do you not use a reel? I, I use a reel if I'm on a vertical structure, um, high channel markers on oiler rigs, or um, if I'm diving in kelp, something along those lines. And I'm also using a reel if I can effectively pull a fish out of the bottom. Um, if you cannot comfortably dive to to the depth of the water you're diving in, maybe consider switching to a float line. It's a lot easier to fight that fish from a float line and um, on the surface, and I feel like it makes it a bit safer. Um, when I'm on a float line, I always rig to a breakaway. Um, I don't like the idea of my expensive spear gun getting in tow with a fish and being a part of that command. And I also like to have a, a wood stick in my hand or an aluminum stick in my hand when I'm on the surface of a to keep the tax fair away. Mm-hmm. Keep, keep, keep the tax bear at bay. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot more comfortable to push those things off with a stick than your hand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, breakaways have their own sort of level of complication, and and a lot of guys don't really use them unless they're deliberately targeting pelagic fish. Um, what's the learning curve uh, adjusting to using a breakaway? Oh, the biggest learning curve is is not not forgetting to grab a hold of your gun <laughs> yeah okay cool what about, what about in terms in terms of rigging is there some common points of failure with the way the guys set up their breakaway yep most guys um especially with uh dyneema and mono um most dynamas um and most monos will stretch about 10 to 15 percent after a big fish so if you don't make that at the proper link your breakaway will be too large for your spear gun and it won't fit back on it but that's also a good indication too that you've shot something really big and might want to consider looking at that rigging and redoing it anyways yeah right okay cool so that's one of those things that just because it looks fine doesn't mean it is and um you know, 50 pound fish is a, is a big fish and they cause a lot of damage to a lot of stress or internal damage that you can't necessarily see. Yeah, that's, a, that's very good. Um, shark clips versus sort of D shackles. Um, how do you, how, how should people, well, how do you think about this? When and where to use them? I personally, um, I use the, the shark clips um, pretty much in every scenario. Uh, just because they're fast and effective, but I am also very diligent, and I change those out annually on all my float lines and, and redo them. It is a spring mechanism that gets open and closed several times, and it sits in that 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 saltwater environment and takes a beating on it. And it's one of those things that they're um, in my mind they're they're it's a cheap enough thing for peace of mind. I do like the D shackles though, but um, I I tend to um, find them to be a little bit of a pain in the ass. You got to sometimes find pliers to open them and close them and. Um, or a crimping tool like that, like they'll seize themselves shut, which is all natural part of the ocean environment. But um, they're they're extremely effective, um, and they are a lot cleaner and a lower profile. But um, if I am going after yellowfin tuna, bluefin tuna, or dogtooth tuna specifically, I will 100% use D-shackles only just because I feel like they're a little bit more reliable. There are some really heavy-gauge shark clips as well, though, aren't they? I mean, how, how do... Um... Sort of, where do you sort of see them failing, or have have you had them fail in the past? Um, the only ones I've ever seen fail is from the, the they they just don't pass that test of time. Like you know, I, I personally change mine out once a year. I watched my dad shoot um, probably an eighty pound cobia over here, and um, you know he never changed out his uh, his shark clip, and it was probably an eight year old clip, and it broke right on the the circle spiral ring in the back where it's coiled up. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Is that typical? But, like, oh, son of a, you know, that whole, like, you know, you cuss a hundred times and I can't believe that got away. I can't believe this thing broke. And I'm like, well, it's a, it's a moving part that's six years old. Like, surprise. I'm not surprised. <laughs> one of our, um, one of our listeners, Steve, he's, uh, wanted to know, um, what gear setup you used to land the 282 pound yellowfin tuna. So what was your setup on that day? 
Sure. So I use a 75 foot bungee. Um, it, it's now our Neptonic bungee. Um, at that time, that I had made that one myself. That went and chained to a Rob Allen foam filled 12 liter float to a 25 foot bungee to a um, a Neptonic style float, which was um, I believe if my memory served me right, it was a it was a Rife standard float, not a three atmosphere float, and all that stuff oh, went wow. underwater for a long, long time. <laughs> right. <on. laughs> it does come it did come back up. Um I in the picture you can see a surfboard float that's on there that I had made out of Divinacell and this was um that fish was shot in two thousand five. That that um Divinacell float I broke off four yellowfin tuna on it that I believe were over two hundred and fifty pounds each. Wow. On that thing causing too much back pressure, which is why I switched over to the other one. So at some point, you do want that gear to go underwater, and you do want it to disappear. Yeah. So you can have you can have too much uh, back pressure on. You can have too big a float. Yep, absolutely. I had 480 pound aircraft cable, a stainless steel aircraft cable on it, and um, I shattered two of them right in the center. It looked like someone was playing tug of war with pickup trucks with it on big yellow oh. fins. Holy moly. It's like shooting a little bus, isn't it? it? It absolutely is. So now the current rig that I use for um for big yellowfin tuna is um a one hundred foot bungee to a twelve liter Rob Allen float on um with the Neptonics clutch on there, and then I use a fifteen foot bungee out of that to an Ocean Hunter um three atmosphere float. Yeah, nice. Those Ocean Hunter three atmosphere floats are friggin' really well regarded. Um, so it's a beautiful float. I love the uh, the lime green color on it. I love the reflector on it. So when you shoot your fish late at night, you're, you you actually got something to see on it. Um, it's it's built like a tank. Mm-hmm. And the float. The first oh, time sorry. I used that float was in the Coral Sea. Um, I inflated it on day one of a ten day trip, and at the end of the the end of the ten days, it had the same capacity, and it didn't didn't shrink, didn't mm-hmm. lose any capacity. Shot some wind. It's a nice dog tooth, you know, with it. It's a really nice float. Yeah, fantastic. Um, the float line clutch is another intriguing idea. So Travis sort of explained it a long time ago in his interview, but give it, can you give us a little bit of a rundown on, on how you use it? Sure. So when I, when I travel a lot, um, you always take a float line with you. So I dive a bit deeper. And um, a lot of times I'll use that. I'll, I have a personal one that I built out that's 130 feet long, and it's got a 10-foot bungee on the front. So it's actually a 120 foot float line with a 10 foot bungee, and then the clutch is there as well. But what I what I like about it is a few different combinations on it. Is one is when you do shoot a big fish, you can actually choke up on it and tighten it, which a lot of guys think it's a bit expensive, and, and that it and that it right it could be. But um, where you shark clip your line, you form a loop in the line where it's attached to your float, and when a that fish makes a second run or a third run, or a big shark comes and smokes that fish, and you're in that loop, you're going with it. Mm. And that's I feel like that's a very dangerous scenario that can be easily eliminated with that clutch. That's that's one of the things I do love about it. The second thing I love about it is with that long float line, if I do find yourself coming back in and you're diving 60 feet or 50 feet like that, you can shorten your float line up to a, the proper length float line that you want on that location. And then you can mm. either let the float line snake out the back of your float or you can coil it up and tuck it underneath the float yourself and have that with you and have the proper link float line to your diving area. So it literally will make one float line link that you want. And then the yeah, other no. thing that I love about it is if you, the other thing, the, the last thing, which is my favorite part of the clutch is if you do shoot a, a nice grouper or a nice snapper and it does get tied up in the rocks, you can, you can go down there and make some investigation dives, make sure that the shaft isn't hung up on any parts of the coral. And instead of back diving that fish several times, you can go to the top and, crank down that clutch as tight as you can to where it tombstones your float. It'll stretch that bungee out that's on the front of that pressure pro. That six foot bungee stretches to eighteen feet and then go in the boat and get a Gatorade and um in a couple <laughs> minutes a couple minutes you'll see that float laid over and your fish is ten feet off the bottom and you don't have to back dive them twenty times and wear yourself out and put yourself in a blackout danger zone either. Yeah, nice. And um does the float line clutch work on any material float line? So does it work on PVC or vinyl? It does work on both. Okay, cool. And um like we see the expensive f- spectra fusion float lines, there's the PVC, there's the poly lines, there's thermoplastic. Um what's your take on them and applications? Cuz I've had a PVC like uh wrapped sort of I think it was I can't remember what 
line was in the shooting line was in the middle of the line was in the middle of it but i punctured it on a reef because i was using a 100 foot line and we were diving a 50 uh 45 feet reef in current and it's wrapped around a bommy and just punctured it which happens to all of them by the sounds of it so uh, uh, like i thought that was a severe disadvantage so obviously the float line clutch is going to help with that but what's your take on the different types of line so personally from a float line standpoint i like vinyl i like the vinyl tube and i feel like it's uh, a very nice durometer it's very um flexible not very stiff um it doesn't twist or tangle up very easily so i like that a lot the pvc i feel like um it's very um it can be very rigid in the water mm. it has a lot of memory on it so if you coil it up and leave it in your garage it wants to stay coiled up and weird looking in colder water it tends to do the same thing um, yeah i do like the rife fusion float line a lot the spectra fusion yep. it's a very nice product they have I'm not a huge fan of the way it's terminated on the end and those crimps can fail because what happens is it's got a foam core in the inside. So if you do buy one of those, I personally cut that heat shrink tube that's off on each end and I tie double figure eights through the same connectors that they give you. And yeah, right on. It, doesn't, it doesn't look nice and clean like Rife has it, but it also doesn't fail because what happens is, is when you first put it under an initial load, everything's fine. But what many people forget is when you put those things under load for two hours with a big yellowfin or a half an hour with a big dog tooth or 30 minutes with a big wahoo, like stuff starts to shrink, fail and collapse. Like, um, that foam core does in the inside and sooner or later that thing shrinks to a point to where those crimps are now too big for it. And it pulls uh, through. Ah, uh, okay. So that is, uh, the, and the other thing that's really nice about that rife fusion float line is extremely lightweight and doesn't take up a lot of room in your dive bag. So it's very nice for travel. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah yep i was just thinking about that i'm just packing for a trip for new zealand now so um st starting to get everything in there i've actually got one of the rife spectra lines on and i've got the 75 foot uh might be 80 feet and i've got a five meter 15 foot bungee on on it and i was wondering how to connect the two um so i've used the d shackle and then i've wrapped it in um and some um, insulation tape. What's your what's your thoughts on that as a as a joiner? Just so that because sometimes you get float lines tangled, and it's generally where they're connected with other lines and things like that. Well, that's what I've noticed in the past. It is. So yeah, that sounds like a really good connection point that you're putting on it. I think that would work out fine. Um, what um is that bungee? Is that a synthetic bungee or is that a? That's a. It's a. It's a. Oh, I thought it was made out of the same thing as like a, a pole spear rubber with um, some uh, poly line through the middle of it, but I'm not I'm not certain to be honest. Sure. So if it's a if it's a synthetic rubber, you'll you should be able to tell it by the way it feels. It'll have like a like a little bit more of like a chalky feel to it versus a rubber feel to it. But um, if that is a if that's a synthetic rubber, put that to the front towards your spear gun. And if it's not, and if it's a latex rubber, you want to keep that as high as you can in the column. You want to put that up by the float. Latex is, um, it, it's, um, when it touches the reef, it'll nuke itself. And then that bungee will be exposed and that line will go slack and wrap around that same coral that nicked it and probably cut it. Ah, so it's latex. So I've definitely got it up the float end. Yes. Yep. Well, the, you know, the buoy, buoy, sorry. Sure. So a, a synthetic bungee with like, um, an, an 1800 pound core in the inside of it you can put that to the lead side and that'll hold just fine along the coral if it does nick or cut that stuff but that ah, okay so that that synthetic rubber is extremely durable on the coral okay cool okay cool cool so you think that setup should be fine i do what are you targeting um massive yellowtail so i'm going to the same place where the world records were taken i don't know that i'm there at the right time of the year to see fish that big but um but should have fun maybe shoot one over 50 60 pounds if i'm lucky yeah that, that'd be a, that's a good fish um and the good side about that fish is, is that bungee you're using should hold just fine and um just you know like any other big fish you get just try to keep them off that structure to begin with and you'll be fine yeah yeah cool all right cool cool it's a big fish but those are um typically those are not gear buster fish so that's a really good compromise i think you'll be in good shape with that gear yeah the, the yellow tails seem to have like a five minutes of like depending on a shot placement sometimes they can punish you for a couple of minutes and then they they they're all right so we'll see how we go i'm i'm, I'm really looking forward to it so it should be interesting next one I had uh, so we've talked a little bit, quite a lot about removing some points of failure. What about muffling noise, uh, and particularly with your rigging? 
some of the stuff like you've got steel parts in there, you've got carbon or, or, or aluminium barrels or even timber. You've got metal on different components. There's rattling and shaking going on, which sometimes is not great for fish uh, unless you're doing it intentionally. So how do you approach that? So, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, a lot of that stuff is, um, is very problematic when your gun is not loaded. And um, this is where I feel like a lot of people will start to talk about this and kind of get in like a disagreement about it. But um, once that gun is loaded, it's under tension. And now that sear is pulled tight. The line release is now pulled tight. The shaft is pulled tight against that in the front. Now the only last thing that you would have that could possibly cause a little bit of noise to any of those two components would be your swivel where it could touch either the wood gun or the carbon fiber barrel or the aluminum barrel. And if that is a thing that kind of bothers you, just put a little piece of a maybe a, like a two centimeter piece of a banding tube over there that you would use for that your power bands are made of. Just yeah. cut that out and slide that over one portion of it and that'll stop that contact to that metal barrel and you're good there. Okay, cool. But um, cool. a lot of times stuff like that's just kind of annoying and um, whether it scares a fish or not kind of can be determined. Sometimes fish like noise and sometimes they don't and that changes on a, a daily basis for reasons that you and I will probably never understand. Mm, cool. I got two more questions for Veterans Vault, and then I, I want to move on. Um, uh, uh, one one listener uh, listener wanted to ask why um, shipping prices were so expensive to Australia because <laughs> he really likes shopping, uh, particularly for spear gun components uh, in the Neptonic site. Sure, um, I, I reckon that we could call FedEx and ask him, but yeah, yeah, maybe we needed we need a better shipping option. Sure. Um, yeah, th to answer that question uh, directly is um, it's a 16-hour flight from Los Angeles. So I reckon I reckon if you guys can move Australia a little bit closer, it wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The joys of shipping are uh, are ever present, aren't they? And this is sometimes I notice like um, gear is very sort of country specific, and it's not because the gear is not applicable and usable in in other parts of the world. It's merely from from shipping and distribution issues uh, that, that that it seems to be like that. So it's very interesting to um, to have a look at that um, when you become aware of some of the gear getting around the world. So um, last question. Uh, oh. Also to answer his question too, um, FedEx and DHL, they charge oversizing on spear guns. So anything that's longer than 60 inches is now considered oversized. So that's a big portion of why the shipping is now so expensive. Yeah, righto, cool. And you had an Eptonics dealer in Australia. Is there? There's, there isn't one anymore? Uh, there is. It's uh, Divers World up in Cairns. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, cool. Um, last question. Essential three or four knots every Spiro should learn. Um, where to learn them and when to use them? Essential knots that every spear fisherman should learn. Double figure eight, absolutely no-brainer. Um, where to learn them? Um, any climbing book, a Boy Scout book, or obviously YouTube nowadays. YouTube is probably going to be the most effective on that second most important knot might be more important than the double figure eight is tying your own bands a constrictor knot or also known as a cinch knot it's basically a clove hitch with an underhand knot involved in that so second most important knot and outside of that those are the only two knots that i truly believe a spear fisherman needs anything else is a bonus okay cool so figure eight and we need the cinch knot yep um, a bowline is also a nice knot to know how to use um if you were a guy who doesn't want to use a swivel, for whatever reason that may be, there's a knot called the mooring hitch. Um, it's all It was designed originally to go over buoys that were on um, big big coral reef structures, so you could tie that over it, cinch it tight, and leave a tail end of it on your boat and pull that thing, and it'll collapse under its own weight. It's a little bit more of a challenging knot for most guys to tie, but it's a very good knot to know. But um, if, you, if you don't have a swivel and you wanted to connect your reel line to your shooting line that's a really nice knot to use because it literally you pull it and it'll, it, it comes undone okay cool cool i think i've seen some of these knots but i'm just unable to um put the language to the actual reality of the knots so i think it, you know just so i'm on board i'm going to get across some of these things that you've mentioned today so the bowl and the figure eight and the cinch knot well, i'm quite familiar with but um, yeah, that's that's cool. I'll try and link some notes, uh, some videos up in today's show notes. So if guys go to noobspiro.com forward slash Jerry, anything we've chatted about today will be actually linked, linked in there. 
Hey guys, today's podcast is brought to you by freedivingsafety.com. It's powered by Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. He won an award and he decided to create something that could help the whole world, every single person wanting to get into freedive spearfishing. There's a whole bunch of foundational principles and knowledge that you can learn at freedivingsafety.com. It'll help you to catch more fish and have more fun, believe it or not. It's not just a safety course. This is practical information in there for helping you to not only manage the risk, but to have more fun and look after your mates and yourself. Check it out, freedomingsafety.com. So I'm going to close out Veterans Vault. Uh, really cool to get geek out on gear with you, uh, Jerry. But um, I wanted to move on to a little bit of a different topic. I um, I also noticed you, you've done a lot of mountain climbing. You've you've travelled a lot for adventure purposes. I had a couple of questions for from um, listeners about um, planning international trips and sort of. Um, how you prepare for them, how you think about them, um, and, all, and and the logistics of it all. Sure. So preparing for them, like that's a, that's always kind of an interesting thing. Um, I oddly enough, I start looking for new dive spots um, on the IGFA, the International Game Fishing Association. I look for where the big fish are, the hook and line guys are catching them because that's those. There's so many more of them compared to spear fishermen. So whenever there's those big game fishermen there that are catching those big fish, there's usually a marina there and you can talk a boat captain into taking you out to those spots to go, to go dive. Okay, cool. So I, I start with that on, on that aspect of it. And then, um, you know, from that aspect, um, once you find where that place may or may not be, um, don't be afraid to reach out to locals and go diving with them. Like no one knows, uh, that territory better than the guy in the backyard. It doesn't matter how good of a diver you are, or how, how long you've been doing this or how little you've been doing this. It's, um, home field advantage is like something very hard to beat. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So Mark and Justin both asked, um, so, you, okay. So you've done your reconnaissance. Maybe you've reached out to a local, um, you've, you've got, you've organized your flights. Are you a checklist guy? Are you, how do you think about that side of things? I am. I'm an absolute checklist guy. <laughs> <laughs> So have you got a generic that you sort of have together for, for offshore diving trips? I, I do. So um, I have for an international trip, depending if there's um, like if I was going to Australia on an international trip, it would be one kit of gear, multiple shafts. Um, if I was going to a third world country that did not have a, an accessible dive shop, I would be going with pretty much two sets of everything for the exception of a wetsuit. But I would definitely okay. be taking a, an extra set of fins, uh, extra set of booties, extra set of gloves, um, extra masks. Stuff tends to get broke, damaged, misplaced, mm-hmm. flies out of the back of a boat. Like you end up um, a lot of times in those places, you're on small pangas and stuff tends to get crashed and it would never break underneath its own scenario. But, you know, and all of a sudden, a hundred pound fish is on like the odd shape of a panga boat and your fins underneath that and bad things happen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, would you mind sending me that checklist? I, I'd, uh, I wouldn't mind sharing it. Absolutely will. Ah, sick. All right, well, that'll be in today's show notes as well, um, as long as you don't mind sharing it with the world. I do not at all. Yeah, cool. I, um, I'm a bit of a checklist dude too, and um, it's great to see how other people prepare, so that'll be really cool. Um, do we finish sort of thinking about planning offshore trips? The other, the other big thing too is um, try to study the, the best time of year. Um, certain fish tend to like full moons. C- certain fish tend to be new moon. C- certain fish tend to be going into the full moon. Try to get that timing right, and also try to learn like the the ins and outs of it. Like a lot of times, a lot of times there's a uh, deep water upwellings that'll come up and green the water out or make it real dirty. So try to get some local knowledge and firsthand knowledge of what water clarity and stuff's like. Don't be a um, this is another one too, where it's going to sound like it. It's definitely can be expensive, but don't be afraid to buy the thermal imagery, the chlorophyll reports of the areas that you're going to be diving into. Sometimes those can be quite pricey, as much as a hundred dollars, but it's better than a three thousand dollar trip to go swim in the mud. Okay. Um, okay. So how does how, how does chlorophyll and sort of some of the surface stuff happening affect your planning? So basically, like I'll look at the time of year it is, and I'll you can buy on certain websites. I believe there's rip charts is one that they use here in the USA, and you can look at rip charts, and then it's kind of like an almanac. So they'll st- they'll show you like what last year's data was. They have all that knowledge, so you can like essentially say, let's just say hypothetically, we want to go for yellowfin tuna in Panama. Well, you can look at we we know that March and April is a very good month for yellowfin tuna in Panama. We know it can be as good as well in May. So you can 
you can look at those chlorophyll reports and then you can talk to the local guides and those chlorophyll reports you can pull up the last four years or five years of what March was looking like and what April was looking like. And then you can overlay those dates to what those past moon phases were. And you can, you can really get some good data on what your trip should be like if everything's in line. And it's just, um, it doesn't guarantee anything. It just puts the odds in your favor. Yeah. Nice. Okay, cool. And, 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 and so water temperature, chlorophyll, both two things you look at. And then, like I, I heard a, a thing the other day that Wahoo always come out thick and fast after a, a big lot of rain. Is that something that you have thought much about? I have not noticed that whatsoever, but um, I have uh, Wahoo has been one of those features. I personally don't know if they're a moon fish or not. I've heard guys that are very seasoned blue water hunters that swear up and down they're a moon fish. And I've had other guys say that they don't care about the moon. I mm. personally believe that Wahoo is a temperature fish. Okay, okay, cool. So you, so like when you get like to, um, like big plumes of warm water, quite often the wahoo will move around in that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that is like um, typically here in Florida, like the down in the Florida Keys, we get a really nice wahoo run, and they seem to be the the most divers tend to do really well when that water is somewhere between seventy one and seventy five degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the one thing that's inconsistent about that is sometimes that water will drop down that cool in November and guys are shooting Wahoo in November mm. and, it <laughs> yeah, yeah. Moon and it might not be. And then sometimes that's happening in February and sometimes that's happening in March. And the Wahoo run is, that's just my personal belief on Wahoo, but I, I definitely think it's very temperature driven fish. Yeah. Nice. Nice. And I think sometimes these species behave differently in, in terms of the way you approach them and hunt them in different parts of the world as well. I think Wahoo is one of those fish I've heard, you know, like behave differently, particularly like Hawaiian wahoo and then say like east, uh, southeast Queensland uh, wahoo. That they, I've heard like vastly different approaches on how, how guys like to hunt them, but um, it's, it's very interesting. I, don't, I have never ever shot a wahoo still, and um, it's, it's on my hit list. So everything I hear about wahoo, my ears perk up at the moment. Sure. Um, I've never shot wahoo in, um, in Hawaii or in Queensland, but I've shot them in Louisiana. I've shot them in Mexico. I've shot them in Belize. I've shot them in the Keys in Puerto Rico. And I've shot them in the Gulf over here. And they, they definitely behave differently on every one of those locations. Mm, mm, cool. Um, any consistent techniques yield results with them? Yeah. So um, when if you're having a hard time closing the gap on Wahoo, the one thing that um, I've found that's very consistent with him is – to whatever direction his face is, is pointing, swim to the surface. If, even if the fish is at, say, 40 feet, if you cannot close that gap on him, swim to the surface in whatever direction his face is, is pick about a 45-degree angle up ahead of him and kick as fast as you can on the water, splashing. Point your gun straight out, and usually that wahoo will race you to no open blue water, and you can probably get within five to seven feet of him. They, <laughs> so they're they're such an aggressive fish that they think that you're going after bait and they'll literally try to race you to it. And then all of a sudden you, you, you can hit them with pole spears at that point. Yeah. Right. Oh, ah, that's really cool. I've never heard that one. That's sick. Okay, cool. So you, you might be down and you can't close the gap. You head to the service and you belt along in a sort of a, a quartering direction in front of the Wahoo. And then, sorry, I'm just repeating it a little bit. And then it'll, it'll race you there and then gives you a nice sort of broad broadside shot as it slows down to look at what you're looking at that that's correct and um i i learned that by by accident i the first one i shot was in uh, louisiana and i couldn't close the gap on him to save my life and i was coming up on the surface and i saw three more wahoo on the surface out in the distance so i literally like just being a maniac i was swimming as hard as i can at those other ones and the, <laughs> the four that were down at the bottom i watched them swim up in front of me and next thing i know all the wahoo were like literally like within five to six feet off of me. And here I am with a four band gun and I shoot a Wahoo and put him under the bungee. Yeah. <laughs> uh, awesome. That's awesome, man. Hey, I, I really want to get onto him. It's, um, it's something I might make a sincere effort to do this year. Uh, um, part of it, a lot of, a lot of spearfishing is opportunity, you know, like you can learn the techniques, you can have the equipment, um, you can have the, your mindset prepared and all the rest of it. But sometimes it's time in the water in the right place at the right time, isn't it? It absolutely is. Mm, mm, but cool. um, you know, that whole that whole opportunity and luck thing, like the more the, you know, it's luck is nothing more than opportunity meets preparedness, right? Mm, mm. 
So if you if you're ready and then you have the opportunity, you're going to make the most of it rather than potentially lose the fish of a lifetime. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. Hey, two parts of the show left. Um, Jerry, thanks for your time today. Um, funniest moment. What's uh, one of the funniest things that's happened here at spearfishing? And uh, and uh, I, I, I always love this part of the show. Oh, man, so... Um, <laughs> so one of the funny... Uh, there's, been, there's been hundreds of funniest moments, but um, the one that kind of sticks in my mind that for the most recent was um, I was on a, a bachelor party in Costa Rica. We were spearfishing... Um, wahoo and mahi and we were after yellowfin tuna and uh the water was kind of uh it wasn't cold but it was it's just typical like costa rica water it was probably 72 degrees 73 degrees it was nice it was november and um we're on a boat and we came across a, a palm tree a coconut tree floating in the water and on this on this thing there's um probably i don't know a dozen mahi maybe 20 25 pounds a piece on it and you know my my dive buddy my dive buddies are there and everyone's like frantic trying to get their gear on like who can get in the water first to shoot these damn things and i'm just kind of like chuckling about it because these guys have never shot mahi before and what's so what was so funny about it is i'm like watching like this these mahi have been on this tree for probably a week mm-hmm. and i'm like you you know these guys are rushing and as they're rushing to get there i just grabbed a mask and a pole spear and got butt naked and got to water <laughs> And started uh, shoot, started shooting the damn mahi, and they're all just everyone at this point is like somewhere between pissed and dying. <laughs> I'm handing them fish like stock neck with no fins on nothing. Gee, <laughs> uh, that's a real big fish, but it's just that it's that classic moment of like you don't need all this damn gear. It's a mahi. Yeah, yeah, and the shock factor of being naked would have been amusing as well. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff man um all right fa- faster pace sort of round of questions to close us out i'll give you three um during your sort of 30 plus years of spearfishing what's the single biggest lesson you've learned single biggest lesson i've learned attention to detail on your gear okay cool um who is the best person to go spearfishing with and why um man that's my dad is my best friend he taught me how to dive yeah sick sick um and um What's something a little different that you do in your spearfishing that you haven't really seen other people do? Something different that I do that I haven't seen other people do? That's a good question. Um, I realistically, the biggest thing I do is I don't follow a lot of the rules of not, not of doing the right thing. So I am, if my friends go out drinking the night before I go with them, if I, I, I'm a huge fan of espresso and black coffee. So I have that every morning because I know it's going to elevate my heart rate, but diving with a headache's awful. So uh, <laughs> that's that's my uh, my recipe is don't break your routine, go have fun. Yeah, nice man, cool, cool. Hey Jerry, um, man, awesome chatting with you today. And I know that a ton of listeners are going to want to connect with you. Um, where can they find out more about you and connect with you online? Sure, the the easiest place would be uh, Jerry at Neptonics dot com or um, on Instagram would be at the Neptonics Worldwide. Sick. I see you around on Instagram a little bit. Uh, you guys have got a fantastic page on Instagram, so Neptonics Worldwide. And uh, I'll link all this up in today's show notes. And, uh, yeah, awesome, Jerry. Uh, fantastic to get you on the show. And I, I wanted to thank Ed Martin from Kill Shot Spear Guns for putting us together. Yeah, big thanks to Ed on that, man. It's been a, it's been a pleasure talking with you, man. I appreciate all the questions. It's been a lot of fun. Ah, cool. Um, we've we've managed to rack up nearly two hours. So, uh, yeah, as usual, uh, a, a, a fantastic chat. Thanks, Jerry. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Isaac. Have a good night, man. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Guerra from Neptonics. What an absolute champion. Love that episode. Cool as to geek out on gear. And the checklist that he mentioned, you can find that and all the other show notes, some pictures and links and all the good stuff, sponsor deals and all the rest of it. Go to noobspero.com forward slash Jerry and get that free download there along with a whole bunch of other um, cool discount codes for quality um, gear and stuff that and courses that 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 i believe in so um yeah noobspirit.com forward slash jerry hope you enjoyed that and uh look in two weeks we are headed back to the u.s i've got another guy down in the florida panhandle 
you've already listened to it once before when we did the DIY uh, wooden spear gun. It's back to Ed Martin. We're going to get right into his journey and some of the things he's learned in, uh, in his time spearfishing. So come back in a fortnight, it's two weeks, and tune in again. If you love the show, guys, again, go to patreon.com forward slash noobspear and consider becoming a patron listener. There's 27 others there, and uh, just so grateful for those guys. They um, Every single dollar that goes into that Patreon um, gets used to fund trips where I get to come out and meet listeners and guests, maybe do some live interviews and go sparing. So I'm um, hoping to get over to the US next year, but um, that's neither here nor there. Hey, thanks for tuning in. See you in a couple of weeks. This episode of the Noob Spirit Podcast is brought to you by spearfishing.com.au. They've been on board for more than 100 episodes, and I'd love for you to shop at spearfishing.com.au. They have a price be guarantee, hassle free returns, flat shipping rates across Australia, and you can save 20 bucks. For every purchase over $200, if you use the code Noob Spirit, you save $20. Thanks for supporting the Noob Spirit Podcast and shopping with spearfishing.com.au. This episode of the Noob Spirit Podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at noobspirit.com forward slash audible. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or MP3 player. Who uses those? Anyway, noobspirit.com forward slash audible.